So we we'll talk about turbulence. So so far we talked about basic fluid mechanics. Now we will go into turbulent fluid. At the end, I'll go into the boundary there. But first, I have to build up the concept for turbulent fluid. So most of the lecture will actually focus on turbulence. The concepts of boundary there. So, very, very famous sketch by Leonardo. I don't know how he did that. At that time, there was no flow visualization. And it is just a fundamental picture of turbulence, but it is so accurate. Turbulence is not an easy concept. We discussed it already because of the nonlinearity of Napier Stokes equation effectively as manifested as turbulence. But if somebody asks you, what is turbulent flow? It's not an easy answer to give. Effectively, in my opinion, there is no answer to be given there. Effectively, you can only tell whenever a flow is turbulent, it shows certain syndromes. If you have those syndromes, then you can call the flow to be turbulent. And effectively, these are the essential syndromes in my mind. So intrinsically unsteady. It is three-dimensional in nature. Sometimes people talk about two-dimensional turbulence. I don't believe in that. Uh, turbulent flow is rotational in nature. That means vorticity is non-zero. Carl of velocity factor is vorticity, that's non-zero. The same thing is often referred to as turbulent flow is full of eddies. It is essentially vortical motion. But mathematically, <coughs> that's what it says. Turbulent flow exhibits a range of widely varying length scales and time scales. So talked about a range of length scale, time scale, and that makes the flow analysis of turbulent motion difficult. We'll see that later. Turbulent flows are essentially high Reynolds number flows. In other words, inertial force <coughs> dominates over physical force. Don't tell that turbulent flow is achieved above Reynolds number 2003. That's a long statement. Please don't that, that is only valid for pipe flow. And that too, it is not a completely correct statement. You, by doing some special arrangements, you can actually make the flow laminar up to 200,000 in pipe flow. Essentially, 2,300 is the lower critical Reynolds number. Below that Reynolds number, the flow is likely to be for pipe Effectively, if you put any perturbation in, this section kills it. Turbulent flow promotes enhanced mixing that that's reflected in terms of effectively greater rate of heat transfer, mass transfer. That's why you stir your coffee or tea after putting sugar in. The typical cup size, if you don't start, it takes 45 minutes for the sugar to mix. I'm sure you are not going to have that tea or coffee after that. And you know, once you start it, how quickly it mixes. That basically demonstrates what turbulence can do in terms of mixing. Turbulent fluid motion is chaotic in nature. Chaotic in nature means if you change your initial condition slightly, the outcome is going to be very predictive. It doesn't mean all chaotic flows are turbulent flows. You can have laminar chaotic flows as well. Okay. So once you have got all these syndromes met, then you can tell the flow is likely to be turbulent. Okay. What really happens then? For any quantity, I can actually break it down to a mean part 
and a puncture. Okay? And very often, this decomposition is known as Reynolds decomposition after Osborne Reynolds, who first used that. And Osborne Reynolds is the person best known, which we call Reynolds number. Uh, now, what it means in terms of the mean? It can be like this, it's a time averaging process, but it is only valid if your flow is statistically stationary. That means your mean is not changing with respect to time. Okay? Alternatively, if this is not valid, in other words, when you are not doing with statistically stationary flow, then you basically do ensemble averaging operation. In which direction you do the ensemble of, of averaging operation? Where there is a statistical homogeneity, statistically identical the direction is, you take the samples from that direction, add them up, subtract with a number of samples. Yeah? So when we are talking about the mean evaluation, it can be different depending on what kind of number. Must be clear that bit because that's an important concept. Effectively, mean of a mean gives you the same thing. Once you have averaged it, it has a single value, right? If you take an average of a constant value, it will return that constant number, right? So that's what we are getting. By definition, mean of the fluctuation is zero. Here, if I have a product of a mean and a fluctuation, and if I take the mean of that, this is essentially behaving like a constant. So it will come out <coughs> of the averaging process. And the average of the fluctuating part is zero. So it will be zero. Hopefully that's clear, but these quantities are not going to be zero. Why? Let's take two cartoon functions. I'm not telling turbulent signal is sine wave by any means. It's just to illustrate the concept. Okay? So if I actually carry out this, then you will get a bar in this manner. 0, b bar to be 0, mean values to be 0. Sine wave, if I integrate, you know what it is going to look like. Positive contribution will be nullified by the negative contribution will get 0. If I do a square, then this integral is not 0. I'm pretty sure you have done such integrals several times. So I'm not doing that, but you can clearly understand. This is not zero. Same for product of two different fluctuating quantities. It may not be zero in this case, as you can see. Okay. So, in the case of tabular flows, you have correlations of this quantity fluctuating quantities in this manner, and they are all, in general, non-zero in turbulent flows. Okay? So this set effectively was my governing equation, which we talked about in the previous lecture, right? Now, what I can do the only difference is this time I have written for three dimensions. The third dimension was not there in my derivation. But procedure remains exactly the same. Now I can break down all the velocities by mean, but getting part. Similarly, I can break the enthalpy to mean and fluctuation. So mass fraction, mean and fluctuation. I don't know why, but there is a bar here, it's not showing. Anyway, so if we now average all those equations, 
you will get this set of equations. If you compare this set with the previous set, you will see on the right hand side, this equivalent terms will appear. But in addition to that, the, the, you will have some extra terms sitting here, which were not present in the previous slide. Okay? So at the moment, all the equations are written in terms of the mean quantities. Now, I have got some extra terms sitting there. And these extra terms effectively arise because of the correlation between the fluctuations. These terms are often referred to as Reynolds stress. These are called Reynolds scalar flux. Obviously, the origins are different. This is because of the enthalpy fluctuation, and these are called the mass fraction fluctuations. Enthalpy or mass fraction, they are scalars. Altogether, they are referred to as scalar flux. If you want to distinguish, you can tell Reynolds heat flux and Reynolds mass flux, if you want. Okay? So, we talked about what last time? We solved for mass conservation equation, one equation, momentum conservation equation, three equations. Three plus one, four. We have energy equation, five, plus uh, the species conservation equation, that is N, number of species conservation equations. How many unknowns we have altogether? We have density, three velocity components, Four, pressure five, temperature, and n. You will see we have n plus five equations. We have n plus six variables. The extra one comes from the equation of state. So now you have n plus six equations, n plus six arguments. But that is only true for the instantaneous quantities. For mean quantities, I can't solve these equations like this because all of these things are not given in terms of the mean quantities. Clear? Now think about it that you have given a, a phone to actually take a photograph for an athletics event. Somebody is running very fast. Image, very often it is going to be a smudged image, right? What you are actually doing within the, the exposure time, you are actually seeing an average picture. By doing that, you are essentially losing the sharpness of the image, right? In other words, you are missing some information because of the average inverse. Person ran during that time. That's a reality, right? That doesn't go away just because your camera does cannot capture it. This is that contribution. The missing physics for averaging. Now, if we have to solve this equation, I have to express these quantities as a function of mean quantities. And that effectively leads us to the calculus. So if I write this mean momentum equation in the tensorial format, take this form. If I multiply both sides by ui, then by a little bit of uh, manipulation, I can get a transport equation for mean kinetic energy for the fluid. Okay? Half mv square, you have essentially that component. <coughs> so it's basically kinetic energy <coughs> by unit mass. <coughs> Clear? If I consider constant viscosity, that then I can bring this one outside, mean, and then I will get this equation. I'll talk about what any viscosity means later on. If I express this quantity, by any viscosity, you will get this equation at the end. 
but I will revisit this equation. What I want you to actually remember, there is a term sitting here with a positive sign. Clear? This one is always going to be negative. It is basically draining the kinetic energy from the mean flow and doing something else. What? I will come to that later. Physical significance for all of those is the temporal change of mean kinetic energy. This one is the affective part which I mentioned last time. This one, transport of mean kinetic energy by turbulent velocity and pressure fluctuations. Please understand, when I'm talking about transport, they don't generate, they don't destroy, they just redistribute. If I bring something a paper and basically give it there, I'm not generating instructive work. Basically, taking something from one place, putting something from some other place. That's what it does. This is molecular diffusion part, and the part viscous diffusion part, originates because of this process. This is dissipation of mean kinetic energy by turbulence and this is the molecular dissipation of kinetic energy. In other words, this star which we call this sign is responsible for draining the kinetic energy from the mean flow. Okay? Why mean this term has a negative sign here. This contribution is positive, mu t is a positive term. So the net contribution is negative. Understood? So what turbulence actually does, it is actually taking energy from the mean flow and doing something with it. Now what it is doing. And kinetic energy is drained by the molecular dissipation or in other words viscous dissipation. Okay. Now let's look at the Reynolds decomposition of the momentum equation. If I actually use the, this is the instantaneous equation, this is the Reynolds decomposition of the same equation and if we look at equation 7, this is our average equation. If we do that, then I will get an equation for the fluctuating component. If I actually interchange i and j, I will get another equation. If I multiply that with uj dashed and this one with ui dashed, I will get an expression for this ui dashed, uj dashed. This is the instantaneous contribution. If I Reynolds average it, then I will get these terms here, these terms disappear because uj dash bar fluctuation, mean of fluctuation goes to zero, for this, these two terms go to zero, and effectively you get this equation, which is the transport equation for Reynolds stresses. You will have six independent Reynolds stresses. It's a three by three system, but it's a symmetric tensor. That's why you'll have six independent components. Okay? Now, just to describe, the first term is the temporal change of Reynolds stress. Second one on the left hand side, this one is the affection term. This is the pressure fluctuation transport. One second transport, no generation. Okay? That means redistribution is taking place. This one is the transport of Reynolds stress by velocity fluctuation. It's a molecular diffusion of Reynolds stresses. Generation of Reynolds stresses. That's what you find in books. I really don't like that description. Because essentially, under certain circumstances, this term can become negative. Instead of generation, it becomes a sink term. I generally think this term should be said that is the mean velocity gradient contribution to the Reynolds stress transport. Okay? 
But keep that in mind. In books, you will get generation of remonstrance. And this is molecular dissipation of remonstrances. Now, if you consider the trace of the Reynolds test cancer, that means UI, UI prime bar, that gives you by definition twice of turbulent magnetic energy. Okay? And if you put in the place of J, I, effectively you will get an expression for twice of K. And that effectively gives us this transport equation for turbulent magnetic energy. It's the exact equation for turbulent magnetic energy. It's not the model one. This is not what fluent or star seeking or CFX solves. Okay? But what I want you to actually appreciate firstly here now this term has a negative sign previously for the mean magnetic energy equation this one had a positive sign. Okay? Clear? So if I told before that that term was responsible for dissipation of mean kinetic energy, dissipation of Y, it had a negative <coughs> positive sign. And as a result, we saw that it actually became negative contribution. It is acting as a sink, it is taking the energy from the mean flow. Now it has appeared with a negative sign. That means now it is a source. <coughs> so turbulent <coughs> basically saps energy from the mean flow. It saps all the energy from the mean flow and feeds into the fluctuations. Okay? So it is taking energy from the mean fluid motion and giving that energy to the turbulent part of the magnetic energy, generating the turbulent fluctuations. Clear the idea, concept-wise? Now, very often, this term is modeled as this. I'm writing it for now in compressible flow. It comes from the fact that this term, this Reynolds stress term, is actually expressed in this manner according to Kuzmi's approximation. So using a gradient hypothesis. Okay? So in the context of kinetic theory of gas, you can have this kind of same term because of the molecular motion fluctuations, and in that case, According to Newton's law of uh, viscosity, we express it in the same manner, but here instead of turbulent viscosity, we put dynamic viscosity. The same analogy is used here. Whether the analogy is correct or not, I am not telling that. But uh, right from the outset, it's an approximation. It's not always correct. So effectively, what I mentioned in terms of uh, earlier, that turbulence in the energy from the mean flow is drained, and that's heading the fluctuating flow. As I mentioned, this term is known as the dissipation rate of turbulent kinetic energy. <coughs> when you solve for K epsilon equation, it does that epsilon. Very often, P and epsilon are two building blocks for actually generating turbulence models and often later on in combustion models as well. So often it is assumed under quasi steady state generation of kinetic energy is same as the dissipation rate of kinetic energy. So there is a local equilibrium maintained between the generation of kinetic energy. So, energy is drained from the mean fluid motion, fed into the fluctuation. That energy eventually is drained by this dissipation rate, 
mechanical energy now is transformed into heat energy. Okay? So if we do this, very often this mean gradient is scaled as 1 upon turbulent time scale, the lifetime of the most energetic vortical structure in the turbulent flow, which is often referred to as AD. It's given by something called integral length scale divided by U prime. U prime is the RMS velocity fluctuation. What integral length scale is, I will explain later, but for the time being, it is the you can consider integral length scale is the length scale with which most energy is concentrated in turbulence. It's the most energetic length scale in turbulent motion. Alternatively, you can consider that if you want to have two statistically independent velocity signals, you have to go that much distance to go there. It's the separation between two statistically independent velocity signals. Clear? So if I now scale this, so I have ui to j, think, right? That will give me u prime square. This one scales as one upon turbulent curve. So that gives me this, which effectively gives me this scaling relation. And if I use u prime is, by definition, RMS, turbulent kinetic energy fluctuation. So it carries as k to the power half. So that means Okay? Now, why this is so important? You have already seen that I have more number of variables than number of equations. If I have to close the system, I have to approximate these quantities with respect to the some mean quantities, right? And that's what is done here when I was writing this thing like this. Okay? So, I need to actually estimate the kinematic AD viscosity and that can be actually written in this manner. This one carries as u prime square, this one carries as u prime over L and that then you can actually tell kinematic viscosity uh, well, the kinematic eddy viscosity scales as u prime times the integral length scale of turbulence. So I need a velocity scale for turbulence, which is the natural one is the RMS velocity. The other length scale is the integral length scale. Now, so if I actually put u prime carries as k to the power half, this one carries as k to the power 3 by 2 over L, so if I actually rearrange this equation, then L carries as k to the power 3 by 2 over epsilon. If you put k to the power 3 by 2 over epsilon and this one k to the power half, you will get this one, any kinematic viscosity carries as k square over epsilon. And that's what is used in k epsilon. Effectively, this is a model cost. Okay? That's the logic. So if I can get k at epsilon, then I can actually express the eddy viscosity and then I can close the system and the model equation will take this form. And these are the standard model constraints. Obviously for depending upon the flow, we will have modulated model constraints, which we will discuss later on. The unclosed terms are modeled in this manner. The, re, the terms because of the pressure fluctuation and the turbulent fluctuation, the ones which are the terms which we distributed kinetic energy, didn't generate or didn't destroy, they were modeled in this kind of gradient hypothesis manner as a turbulent diffusion of kinetic energy. Dissipation rate of kinetic energy can alternatively be actually scaled in this way. So you can write, understand mean divided by rho is kinematic viscosity. There's no surprise there. You have del ui prime del j. 
here I have a velocity scale plus. So I have written u prime squared. I think there is no problem there. I have actually used the scaling for the gradient of fluctuating quantities by a length scale, which is called Taylor's microscope. Okay? And it is given like this. And for homogeneous isotropic turbulence, homogeneous means I can take statistics at any point which gives me the same statistics. Okay? Isotropic means it's not dependent on direction. Okay? So if I come, that's the simplest form of turbulence. Why people talk about homogeneous isotropic turbulence? Because we think, and there is enough evidence to believe that at the small scale, all turbulent flow behaves like homogeneous isotropic turbulence. Okay? Then you get this relation. Effectively, you can see similar things. There is a scaling exact constant is here. Clear? So, Taylor microscale is also closely related to integral length scale. I have already told that integral length scale can be taken to be separation of statistically independent velocity signals. But this is the way to actually quantify it. This is called correlation function. Here you have velocities fluctuations separated by a distance. And these are normalized by their RMS values. So you can ge generate different correlation functions. This is a basically a tensor R11, R2, R2, R3. And if you have a statistically similar isotropic turbulence in two and three directions, you will be able to see. And you can define the integral length scales in this manner, just integrating the correlation functions. <coughs> For homogeneous isotropic turbulence, L2, 2, L3, 3 is half of L1. But that is just for information. This is the important concept, that's how you actually obtain the integral length scale based on the correlation function. How it looks like, if you consider this is the correlation function, when the spatial separation is zero, velocity signals are perfectly correlated. The correlation coefficient is 1. Okay. Then, as you go away from that situation, when you increase your separation, the correlation drops. Okay. Correlation coefficient obviously is bound between minus 1 and plus 1. You cannot take any value beyond that. At a large distance, takes a very weak negative value. People are not sure why a slight negative thing is observed, but that's really the critical part. And the integral of this line gives you the integral length scale. So in other words, if I actually draw a rectangle which has the same area as that of area under this curve, that gives me the integral length scale. Yeah? So, 
scale over lambda, that is as Kaplan Reynolds number to the power half. If I put u prime as u k to the power half, l as k to the power 3 by 2 over epsilon, effectively r in t, Kaplan Reynolds number times k squared over epsilon over that. And that effectively tells us is the integral length scale can alternatively be interpreted as the length scale where most of the energy of the magnetic field is concentrated. So it's the most energetic length scale of calculus. So how the energy is distributed for different length scales? I can define a wave number like this. It's just a mathematical construct. Just consider it varies like this pi over Le. Le is the length of the eddy, characteristic length scale of the eddy. If you want to visualize it <coughs> for the time being, just consider as if that is the typical radius of the vertical structure. Okay? Which is not the fully accurate case, which I'll show you in a couple of minutes, but for the time being, you can consider that is a rough description of the vertical structure. This is how it looks like. It's log log scale. Effectively, here I have got inverse of length scales and this is how the energy is distributed over different length scales. Very often this plot is referred to as turbulent magnetic energy spectrum. Y spectrum, if you integrate it from a very small value <coughs> to a large value, you get a total turbulent magnetic energy. Okay. <coughs> Please understand large kappa, large wave number means small length scale, small kappa means large scale. It attains a peak for a wave number which is closely related to one of one integral length scale, consistent with what I just told a few minutes ago. This part is called inertial range. What really happens? You have big eddies. The biggest eddy is here, right? Here. The big eddy, because of the fluid thermic instabilities, breaks down to small eddy, smaller eddies. In doing so, it is distributing its energy to its offspring, that means smaller eddies. Those eddies are, are also unstable. Okay? They are essentially giving up their energy to the eddies <coughs> which are generated based on their breakups, so its offsprings. But their offsprings are smaller, they have smaller energy. And this process continues. At one level, eddy breaks down, gives the energy to the next generation of eddies. The next generation passes that over to the following generation. So and so happens until you reach here. Throughout this process, viscosity does not play any important role. Analysis essentially considers it is completely independent of viscosity. There are some evidences that viscosity plays some role, but not a significant role. At this point, I have reached a very high wave number. In other words, small length scale. At that point, viscous action becomes important and the time mechanical energy is converted rapidly into heat energy. So that's why you can see from this point there is a sudden roll off. Okay? Jumps suddenly because at that point viscosity takes over converts all the mechanical energy into heat energy. The length scale where it happens, 
it is inverse to a Renan scale, which is extremely, extremely important, known as full mover of the length scale. That's the smallest length scale of turbulence. So, for all practical purpose, it's called dissipation wave number, energetic wave number. For all practical purpose, instead of putting zero and infinity here, I can actually write energy spectrum D kappa going from this to this because it is shown in log scale if that this part is actually magnified. You know very well when you draw in log scale, the small values are magnified. Yeah. Sir, at that point, uh, at the last of inertial range, uh, based, uh, based on the length scale, the turbulent, uh, uh, this turbulent Reynolds number will be this much lower. It is nothing to do with turbulent Reynolds number. How long this, how long this separation is, that is determined by Reynolds, the turbulent Reynolds number. A turbulent Reynolds number is dependent on RMS velocity and integral length scale. So. The value of Reynolds number does not change, but where this thing will happen, that changes. Give me one more minute, we'll probably see what happens. So, I'm coming back to the assumption that during the inertial range, effectively, the energy content is determined by only two things. One is dissipation rate of kinetic energy and that and the length scale of the eddies. I can write length scale or inverse of length scale, kappa is inverse of length scale. So I have three quantities, right? I'm sure all of you need dimensional analysis. And now in that, at this juncture, I am going to info copy comes by here. So I have got three quantities. The dimension of kinetic energy spectrum is given by this. Okay? <laughs> dimension of kappa is one upon length scale. Dissipation is length squared divided by time q. So if I have three fundamental dimensions here, but here I have only two fundamental dimensions, length and time, and I have three quantities. So three minus two, you can generate only one non-dimensional group, right? So if I put all the quantities, put raised to the power a and one and b one and it to the right hand side, you will get these two results and that effectively gives you this. I1 being a constant, right? And this is essentially known as Kolmogorov of spectrum. Generally, this I1 comes up to this A1.5. <coughs> Now, next thing which I am going to talk about, which he asked about the length scale. At what length scale? This is the length scale where the kinetic energy is converted into heat energy. So, obviously, I told dissipation rate is responsible for changing the mechanical energy into heat energy. So, that's an important quantity to consider. I'm interested in finding the length scale anyway, right? So that has to be there in the picture. And this quantity, kinematic viscosity, has to be there because we know that that plays a role. Once again, if I now consider that effectively I have three quantities, but if you look at the dimensions, only two fundamental quantities are involved. So three minus two, once again, I can generate only one non-dimensional group. If I do that, and if I put the, the dimensions to it, left-hand side and right-hand side exponents, 
I'll get AD pi 2 carries as this. It is dependent on kinematic viscosity as well as the dissipation. Obviously, there is a constant here, not dimensional quantity here, but if we disregard that, write as a scaling function, that length scale carries as this, but this is called Kolmogor of length scale. At this point, if I use this scaling here, which carries as this, and that effectively gives us this relation. Integral length scale, um, Kolmogorov length scale ratio, carries as star and Reynolds number to be equal three four. Have you got your answer now? Yeah. So, essentially, how deep the separation is going to be, that is dependent on star and Reynolds number. Higher the Reynolds number, larger the length scale separation. You are going to see larger length scale, larger range of length scales in terminal Okay? So if I keep my dimension constant, I think so a duct, your largest length scale is determined by the dimension of your duct. You will start to see smaller structures at higher Reynolds number. I can use that scaling where I use this up to the full number of length scale. So by using that, I can get an idea about the length velocity scale of the full number of eddies. That means that's the velocity scale of the smallest turbulent eddy of any significance. Okay? And by using again this relation, one can actually get the separation between the, the RMS velocity scale and the Kolmogorov velocity scale. And that is also a function of turbulent Reynolds number. So the velocity range is also determined by turbulent Reynolds number. Clear? The lifetime of large scale eddies is given by this. Here is the integral length scale, u prime with the RMS velocity fluctuation. And this is often referred to as any turnover time. Because that's typically the length of lifetime of the AD. After that, it breaks down to smaller ones. If that's the case, the lifetime of the smallest AD is given by this over of length scale dependent by its velocity scale. And if I actually use the relations that I got earlier, one gets this. If once again, if I use epsilon as u prime q over l, it gives me this relation, and that gives me the separation between the, the large scale turbulent time scale to the small scale turbulent time scale. That is also turbulent. So, so far we have seen length scale separation, velocity scale separation, time scale separation are all functions of turbulent Reynolds number. Not the flow Reynolds number, once again, turbulent Reynolds number, which is dependent on RMS velocity fluctuation and integral. So, so far I talked about eddies. What do you mean by so far, we have introduced integral length scale, Taylor micro scale, Kolmogorov of length scale. Yes? This is how it looks like. It is a vortex scheme. Okay? This undulation length is typically the integral length scale. If I think about the loop, this separation is Taylor microscale. And if I think about the individual tube, if you think in terms of the tangential velocity of the vortex tube, that's the velocity scale of Kolmogorov of velocity scale. Hopefully, at least you can visualize the turbulence a little bit better now that what really happens. 
yes. So you have this is a for, typical vortex cube. They are convoluted. Okay. It is submerged in a fluid motion which is essentially moving with new primes. That's the RMS turbulence velocity fluctuation. The rate, the vortex cube has a thickness of one over of length scale. So you can consider as if the diameter is of one over of length scale. Okay? If you think in terms of the tangential velocity of the vortex cube, that's of the order of velocity scale of one over of length Now, spanning at a region of length L with a characteristic corrugation length, so this loop, in some ways, if you think in terms of the wavelength, the lambda is related to the wavelength of the corrugation. And from where it is, this length scale is the typically integral length scale. This is not 100% truth. But more or less, that's how the structure looks like. Okay. Typically, these are the dimensions which are attached to a turbulent vertical pitch. Okay. So hopefully, the concepts I can fully appreciate. These are very abstract concepts, but now you can perhaps start to visualize how the turbulent fluid motion takes place because you will have several of these kind of cubes present in the floor. Here? Now, scalar transport. So far, what we talked about, what happens in the context of momentum. This was my intern, uh, instantaneous species conservation equation. One thing to notice, based on our discussion so far, that when this term is there, it can affect all the flow field through temperature, through density, and so on and so forth. If you have that kind of situation, the scalar in question is referred to as basically uh, <coughs> scalar, when the scalar is just affected by the flow, it does not affect anything, then it's called passive scalar. In the case of passive scalar, there will be no source term. Okay. Homogeneous mixture is this one. 
optical anticipation. It actually kills any kind of scalar fluctuations. Next, tries to make a homogeneous mixture. But a chemically reacting system, this one tries to generate scalar fluctuations because of chemical reaction. This one tries to kill it. There's an equilibrium between these two. And often it is modeled in this manner where you can see epsilon and k, which are needed for turbulence modeling, coming to play. And again, here, epsilon y, which is the scalar dissipation rate, is taken to be proportional to scalar variance with a time scale which is attached to turbulent time scale. k over epsilon, you can see from the scaling, it is same as k over epsilon d, will give you integral time scale of turbulence. Plus, but one important thing to notice here, this is not an exact equation, I said model, model is a glorified name of approximation. It works to some extent for passive scalar mixing, just mixing problem. When you have chemical reaction, this tries to, it, it doesn't always work very well. Right? Just as I mentioned in the context of normal and fluid motion, you can generate spectrum for scalar as well. This is equivalent to, to kinetic energy, turbulent kinetic energy, but this time with scalar fluctuations. And you can have correlation functions like this for scalars as well. But please note that the scalar integral length scale is not necessarily equal to the integral length scale of turbulence. Similarly, the time scales of scalar fluctuations are not necessarily equal to the large scale turbulence. Very often, another time scale comes into uh, length scale comes into play, which is called bachelor time length scale, given like this. Previously, for Kolmogorov length scale, here we had this kinematic viscosity Q. Now you have kinematic viscosity plus D squared. D is the diffusivity, mass diffusivity. So it is actually related to uh, Kolmogorov length scale by Schmidt number. So effectively, when Schmidt number is less than 1, if we consider that length scale of turbulence and scalar fluctuation length scale integral length scale are exactly the same. It starts identically, comes up to this point, but at this point, molecular diffusivity starts to play a role, and actually, because of the scalar dissipation rate, the scalar fluctuations are clear. Whereas, if you are dealing with the, the speed number which is greater than one, this can carry on up to the bachelor time length scale, and then essentially it rolls off. So this thing happens for gases, because gases has to be number less than one. If you are talking about liquids, effectively, although the kinetic energy is dissipated at this level, scalar fluctuations continue at our level, up to a much smaller length scale up to bachelor time, length scale is achieved. One important pointer at this point, that if you consider a very, very high Reynolds number, your kinematic viscosity is not a material property. It varies as U prime, which is RMS velocity fluctuation times integral length scale. Both are flow properties. Right? What is the nature of the fluid? We don't care. But when it comes to scalar and turbulence effects on the scalar, we can't ignore the nature of the fluid. Speed number plays a very important role, as you can see. So, this is how the turbulent boundary layer looks like, as you know from your undergraduate fluid dynamics or heat transfer module that it starts as a laminar 
velocity. Effectively, in the velocity scale, normal to the the wall is much smaller in comparison to the streamwise component, but it is not zero. That effectively puts the information to the pristine fluid to slow down. More fluid is entrained within the boundary layer. Effectively, your inertial force increases, and eventually, one gets laminar to gradual transition. The transition process is not well known; it's an active area of research. But effectively, this is the process it goes through. What really happens? You see from the top up to this point, you have a stable laminar flow. Then we start to see this kind of linear waves, they are called polymer switching waves. Then they become non-linear, like this. Then individual vortex cells break down, and then you get more non-linear structures, and at this point you are going to get some individual turbulent regions, submerged in relatively quite fluids. <coughs> I'm not telling that's not turbulent, I'm just telling the velocity in those regions are much smaller in comparison. And the motion is less chaotic in comparison to this one. Okay? They grow in the downstream. So effectively if you see the signal from a wind tunnel in an oscilloscope, you will suddenly find a blip and then nothing is there. It's very intermittent in this region. And then these turbulent spots will grow and you will have a full fledged turbulent. Whole process up to this point, not very well known until now. Very active in your research. Now, this is textbook material. You probably have seen that. However, some books write this region as laminar subler. Please try not to use that because it's not a correct terminology. It's not a laminar region. Essentially, the right terminology is a viscous subler, which effectively means that if I look at the effective stress, when I'm talking about effective stress, I'm considering the stress induced by viscous action plus the carburetor stress. Here, it is basically determined by laminar. Laminar means basically coming from the viscous action. So viscous action is really strong in this part. Buffer region, both contributions are equally strong. As you go away from the wall, the effective part is almost equal to the turbulent part. Basically, the stress is coming purely due to the turbulent fluctuations. So, if we do this type of transformations, one can actually write within the fiscal sublayer this kind of relation, linear relation. One can show in the buffer layer it's going to be some function, and this is the inertial layer, in other words, logarithmic layer because of the functional relations between u plus and y plus. You must have seen this several times already. Kappa is one term as constant taken to be roughly 0.1. Whether it is 0.4 or 0.41, people are fighting over it, but I'm not going into that. About 0.4. And in the weight region, that is affected by free stream, there can be some extra functions, which is dependent on the y over delta, delta being the this is how it looks like. So effectively, in this region, weight region, it deviates from the log log. And the intercept, y intercept, also depends on Reynolds number. It becomes independent of Reynolds number at frictional Reynolds number of 395. Beyond that, based on direct numerical simulation data, this y intercept doesn't change much. But below that, it changes. 
qualitative picture in a sense, exactly the same. So, tau FXT <coughs> is given by mu p, that's the AD viscosity, plus mu, which is the dynamic viscosity. Please note, I told dynamic AD viscosity is a flow property, not a material property, but this one is a material property because mu t is density times the kinematic viscosity. Density is a material property. Okay. So from there, I can get this relation, or in the logarithmic region, effectively mu t over mu carries as y plus on this relation. When it comes to the thermal transport, it's the same thing, effective heat flux is the molecular part plus the turbulent part. This part comes from the Fourier's law. And this part comes because of the gradient hypothesis, <coughs> because of the correlation between the fluctuations of velocity and temperature. And if I can rewrite this equation in this form using the, the definition of thermal diffusivity. Alpha is the thermal diffusivity. And T plus becomes a non-dimensional temperature. One case this relation. And that can be written using the definition of y plus in this manner. So t plus within the boundary that carries as this. Once again, please note here PRT is a model constant. It's a turbulent triangle number. It's a model constant. But please understand when I'm talking about constant with a pinch of salt. It's not really constant. It's basically a fast factor too fit your results. Okay. The second thing is, Prandtl number is a material property. When you change the fluid, Prandtl number changes. Okay. So what really happens in the region close to the wall where molecular diffusion dominates over the area thermal diffusion, 1 upon PR is greater than this. In the region where both of them are equally important, that's a buffer layer equivalent. And this is a full fledged uh, turbulent situation where this part dominates over this part. And effectively, you can consider this kind of situation. If this is the viscous somewhere, when you are dealing with practical number much, much greater than one, the diffusion layer is going to be smaller than the viscous somewhere. Effectively, the whole part you have to have compression. In the case of Prandtl number much much smaller than one, your diffusion layer is going to be much thicker in comparison to this subject, and then you will have the turbulent compression. So, turbulent boundary layer for the thermal boundary layer or species boundary layer. Please understand in the case of species is similar to what I showed for the thermal boundary layer, but the only difference is instead of Prandtl number, replace that with mu number. So if people tell, and often in textbooks people tell that the fully turbulent flow of the behavior is independent of fluid properties, that's not the case. It is true only for momentum transport when you are talking about thermal transport or scalar transport, the material properties signature is still retained. Okay? And then based on that, you can actually do some transformation and you can come up with a log law for temperature profile within the thermal boundary layer. But it is not as clean as the derivation of velocity log layer. I already told PRT is roughly a constant, it's not exactly a constant. And this is a rather clumsy integral that obviously changes with every fluid. Okay? So people have come up with some kind of ad hoc function there. And very often, this is people got from experimental data by fitting the experimental data. And essentially, this is only one textbook. This is it's a very famous textbook by Case and Crawford. Basically, came up with this function, but it's not necessarily fully correct. DNS results subsequently showed that it can vary slightly. Okay. 
composed of this. But roughly the idea is this. You can look at the variation of P plus to Y plus. And depending upon the fluid, the behavior is very, very different. If I actually show you P plus Y plus plot for these two fluids, they will be coincident. You won't be able to distinguish. But T plus Y plus is dependent on the fluid property. And based on that, effectively you can come up with a standard number expression in terms of skin friction coefficient, so on and so forth. These are essentially given just for your information, but the bottom line is the scalar nature is written in turbulent flow or turbulent boundary. Okay. Very often, effectively, alpha t is given in this way, where prt is the, the turbulent triangle number generally taken to be 0.9. But I will once again tell, treat this expression with a little bit of caution. There are strong assumptions involved coming to this expression. It may not be correct all the time. It is correct for passive scalar mixing when you have reacting flow where you have an active scalar. It is may not be correct. Effectively, whatever I told is summarized here, and with that, I'll stop. There's a lot to take, but the sli slides will be made available, I believe. Yeah. So, thank you. Okay. Or the order of unit. That doesn't mean that's the case. If people use from Halus 0.7 to 1.2, uh, there is very little theoretical significance of having it just makes the modeling 